Good morning and welcome to the Texas Oil and Gas Association, Greater Houston and Southeast Texas Virtual Energy Summit. To say we are in unprecedented times is an understatement. The disruption to society from the COVID pandemic has made everyone worldwide adjust our way of living, of working and educating our children. That's why we're bringing to you this virtual energy summit, powering your community. Oil and gas has been the cornerstone of the Texas economy and will continue to be. The greater Houston and Southeast Texas region is dynamic to our economy. And we have a very insightful program today on how we can all power forward together. No event is possible without partners. And I wanna start by thanking Texoga's 2020 event sponsors, Concho Resources, PDC Energy, Oventive, and the Port of Corpus Christi. A huge thank you to our Energy Summit Series sponsors, Marathon Petroleum, Occidental, Sempra LNG, and Energy Transfer. And we couldn't do this without our partners in Houston and Southeast Texas, Arch Rock, Texas Chemical Council, Houston Association of Professional Landmen, and the Greater Houston Partnership. This region is the domestic and international hub for virtually every segment of our state and nation's oil and natural gas industry, from exploration and production, refining and manufacturing, transmission, marketing, servicing, trading and exporting, and increasingly so, the industry's technology and innovation epicenter. Home to 4,600 energy-related firms that employ nearly a third of the nation's jobs in oil and gas extraction. It's also home to one in 13 of the nation's manufacturing and refining sector jobs. And this powerful region accounts for more than a quarter of the U.S. refining capacity. The greater Houston and Southeast Texas region truly is the undisputed energy capital of the world. And just as this mighty region has prospered, so has Texas. Whether you live near the oil patch along the southeast coast of Texas or in a downtown Houston condo, every aspect of life in Texas benefits from the tax revenue generated by a robust oil and natural gas industry. Think about this, in 2019 alone, this industry paid over $16 billion in taxes and royalties to fund our schools, our roads, our first responders, and much more. And the industry directly supports over 400,000 jobs in Texas. In the Houston area, the average salary for oil and gas industry jobs is $140,000, double the average salary of all Houston area jobs. Right now, it's important to know that while producing the revenues that fund our schools, roads, and first responders, oil and natural gas companies are simultaneously investing heavily in environmentally sound technologies that are resulting in significant environmental progress. Pioneering technologies, innovations, and advancements allow the industry to develop and deploy cleaner energy technologies and world-class emissions control systems. This industry's commitment to progress is the major reason why air quality worldwide has dramatically improved over the last 20 years. All in all, we know Texas is cleaner, stronger, and better because of the positive influence of oil and natural gas produced and processed right here in the Lone Star State. And Ladies and gentlemen, this recognition isn't industry only knowledge, and it's certainly not a partisan fact. It is a Texas thing. A recent study confirms it. Seven in 10 Texans support a candidate who supports domestic energy production. Another recent national report revealed that U.S. workers enjoy and prefer working in oil and natural gas jobs, saying they provide better pay, better health benefits, pensions, and career opportunities than those in the renewable industries. This is important. It's important because many politicians are talking about transitioning oil and natural gas industry workers into the green energy sector. But that means a lower standard of living for hundreds of thousands of families when you consider the higher pay scale in oil and natural gas. So it's important to know that any plan seeking to undermine this industry will actually set back climate progress it will put Texans 
out of jobs. It will decrease funding for our state and local governments, and it will increase your energy costs, all while making us dependent on foreign sources for our basic energy needs. Knowing how imperative this industry is to our state, it is so important to make your voice heard in the upcoming election. On the screen, you see important voter registration information and upcoming deadlines. Please be sure to mark your calendars to go vote this year, take a family member with you, take several friends with you, as a matter of fact. It's important that you vote, and it's also important to back candidates who understand we can have both a good environment and good jobs. Now I want to introduce our first guest speaker today. Despite two economic downturns and two major hurricanes over the last decade, the greater Houston region demonstrated remarkable growth. Then came 2020. Uh, essential oil and natural gas employees have powered communities through these extremely difficult times with the fuel and essential supplies needed to fight an ongoing global pandemic. But how is the fight for economic recovery going? We are pleased to welcome today regional economist and senior vice president of research at the Greater Houston Partnership, Patrick Jankowski, for an update on how the energy capital of the world is recovering. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate you inviting me to speak to, to your group and to the Texas Oil and Gas Association. Uh, you guys are a very important industry for the state, and you will always will be a very important industry for the state. But uh, unfortunately, you're facing some challenges, but that's nothing new for the oil and gas industry. So let's get started. I want to start with just a quick overview of where we are with Houston's economy. Uh, most of the job losses related to the pandemic took place in March and April. We lost about 350,000. Since then, we've added back 113,000, but it still leaves us 236,000, almost a, a quarter of a million jobs left that we need to recoup. Uh, the good news is that initial claims for unemployment insurance are going down. You can see where we peaked early in spring in March and April, and they're still elevated, though, about three times the level they should be. Uh, probably one of the bigger concerns is this continuing claims. This is for people who have been unemployed two or more weeks and need to file a, a claim a second or third or fourth week. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we were only at about 32,000, 33,000 continuing claims. Now we're at about 230,000 claims. So there's still over 200,000 people, or roughly 200,000 workers out there who have not been able to find employment, who are still needing to file on an ongoing basis for benefits. We won't see strong economic growth until these people get back to work. And we also need to think about it from a social aspect. What do we need to do to make sure these people aren't suffering in the downturn? If you want to see where the pandemic job losses are, uh, it's ebbed and flowed a little bit. But if you want to see where we are right now, where the deficits are, you can see them on the screen. You can see restaurants and bars are down almost 42,000 jobs. The government sector, 41,000 almost. Construction, close to 28. Manufacturing, close to 18. Now, restaurants and bars, that's understood because of the, the bars are still shut down and the restaurants are opening or operating at, at less than full capacity. Most of those government losses are associated with education. Uh, two thirds of everybody who works in government in this part of the state works for a community college or a school district or a state funded university. So those jobs, losses will start to shrink pretty soon as school fully reopens. Construction's a little bit weak. Manufacturing, the losses are associated with the downturn in the oil and gas industry. Healthcare and social assistance, you need to pay attention to the last two words in that title, social assistance. Social assistance includes things like nursing homes and daycares, especially daycares. And a lot of them shut down during the pandemic and have not opened back up. But you could go on and you can see that uh, there's still gaps in almost all sectors of the economy left to be recouped. But we are seeing some progress. If you look at finance and insurance has actually recovered everything it lost in the first few months of the downturn. Why, you may ask? Well, there were pandemic loans that were made out there. There was uh, the PPP loans. One of the bankers I talked to said they had more business in two months dealing with the PPP loans than they have in a full year. So the banks had to bring people on to deal with those. Administrative and support services, that's where contract workers fall. Think about those are gig workers. As the economy reopens, companies are going to be a little bit re reluctant to bring people on full-time, so they'll bring them on contract. Retail is slowly opening up. Professional scientific and technical services. 
Those are white collar jobs. They didn't lose that many during the downturn. They do tend to lend themselves to working remotely. And so that's why these four sectors here seem to be doing uh, among the best. If you want to look at the sectors that have made good progress on the road to recovery, restaurants and healthcare and social assistance, other services, uh, that's where you're going to find the beauty salons, the barber shops, the nail salons, the auto repair shops, appliance repairs, and so forth. Arts and entertainment recreation, uh, that tends to be seasonal, and we might not see much of recovery because that tends to peak in the summer and then start to drop off in August and September. And also, that's where the symphony, the opera, the ballet will fall. That's where uh, the, the Texans and the Astros and the Rockets fall. So you can see how that sector is struggling a little bit. And that yellow, I yelled at it, I highlighted it. The total non-farm overall, down about a third. So we still have about two-thirds of the job left we need to recapture. Some sectors are really struggling. It's real estate, rentals, and leasing. Uh, I need to pay attention to the last two words, rentals and leasing. That's the le leasing of equipment, of appliances, of furniture. The real estate sector isn't doing too bad, but all the equipment and rental companies uh, with the weakness in construction and concerns over COVID are doing as well. Hotels, you can see educational services, it's private education. I expect that to pick up as fall picks up. But construction is struggling, even though it is a essential industry because we are starting to see projects being put on hold. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And transportation and warehousing, which is tied to manufacturing. And there are, unfortunately, four sectors out there that are losing ground. We have lost more jobs in, in May, in June, in July, and August than they lost in, in March and April. And that's government. But once again, that's the seasonality of, of students and, and teachers and educators being home for the summer. As those numbers will start to show up in the September and October numbers, we'll see that improve. Manufacturing, it's all tied to the oil and gas industry, guys. We see a drop off in the manufacturing of, of pipes and valves and flanges and oil field equipment. Mining and loggings where energy falls and information is telecommunications and media. So that's how we are kind of in the broad sectors. So but let's talk a little bit more specific about the energy industry and, and what we see going on in the energy industry. One of the reasons the industry is suffering is because oil prices are just so low. I mean, I, I long for the days, or maybe we all long for the days, or we wistfully think of the days. Back in the summer of 2014, when oil was selling for close to $106 a barrel, and it got down to around $30 a barrel during the fracking bust. We thought it would never get any lower. But during the COVID bust, it got down as low as $16.5. And right now we're seeing it trading anywhere between you know, a little below 40, a little above 40. Uh, it's, it's not a good place for oil to be to, to spur activity because uh, this is a survey the Dallas Fed has done. Maybe you've seen it, but they asked the question, what price do you need to cover the operating uh, expenses for existing wells? Most firms can get by covering the cost of an existing well at where oil prices are right now, but they're just covering costs. That doesn't mean they're making very much profits. It gets even a little bit more concerning when you ask the question a different way and says, what price does your firm need to profitably be drill a new well? Now, the, the average per, per play is anywhere between $46 or $52 a barrel. So let's just say uh, 40, $48, $49 a barrel is the industry break-even average, and we are well below that. And if you look at EIA or IEA or OPEC, all those alphabet energy associations, they're not looking at oil prices returning to $50 a barrel this year, and perhaps not next year. It might be early 2022 before we get oil back to where it's at a level that might be able to sustain some activity. Now, granted, you can look at this. There are firms that are going to be making that can drill and make a profit with crude below $40 a barrel or below $45. Hopefully, we'll get up to $45 but not that many. So there's still going to be some challenges for the oil and gas industry going forward. Oh, excuse me. I accidentally tried. So you can look at the U.S. rig count and you can see with low oil prices, no wonder the U.S. rig count has gone down. Uh, I thought 404 was the lowest I'd ever see the rig count in my lifetime. And now it's at 261. Now I remember back in the 80s when the rig count hit 4,500 rigs and I thought that was great. Uh, you can see with the rig count down, what's happened to production. Part of this is the shut-ins that occurred during the pandemic. Part of it, we're just not drilling new wells or enough new wells to replace production. So 
the Fed asked the same question, that same group of uh, executives a question, do you think U.S. oil production has peaked? And uh, kind of scarily, 66%, about two thirds of the oil executives in their survey, and this is a survey of oil executives with operations in, in New Mexico and Oklahoma and Texas, two thirds of them think that maybe U.S. production has peaked. So definitely energy employment in Houston has peaked. Uh, this is exploration production, oil field services, oil field equipment manufacturing, pipes, valves, flanges, engineering, kind of all rolled into one. What we at the partnership like to think of is, as upstream energy. And you can see where we are right now with 207,000 people working in those sectors, the kind of the upstream energy. If you go all the way back to the peak was December of 2014, we had 300,000. So we've roughly lost a third of the jobs in the last six years. And what's kind of sad is if you look at this, where we are today is about where we were in January 17, or where we were in early 2010, or even back to where we were in 2006. And the problem is, as we hit the, those levels on the way up, we hit this 207,000 on the way down. Uh, and the real challenge for this is just the oil and gas industry pays very well. It is the best paying industry in Houston if you look at this, this comes from the Texas Workforce Commission. This is the average weekly wage in the fourth quarter of last year. So you can look at someone in exploration production on average could make 200,000 a year. That's 52 weeks times 4,000. Even someone who's in oil field equipment manufacturing, oil well drilling can easily make over 100,000 a year. And so one of the challenges for Houston, for the region, for the state is what jobs are gonna be replacing these good paying jobs that, that we are losing with the uh, shrinking the oil and gas industry. No, but it's, it's not all bad news. There are some out there who think that things are going to be looking up. Uh, City, which has a very well-known uh, energy lending practice, they actually think that oil will hit $60 by 2021, and that would be good news. ConocoPhillips is a bit of a contrarian. They think oil demand will return and continue to grow. So we haven't hit peak oil yet. Personally, I'm kind of siding with ConocoPhillips because I think... Uh, you know, the world prior to the pandemic was consuming 100 million barrels a day. Right now we're consuming around 92 million. I can see in two or three years us getting back above 100 million barrels. But some companies are hedging their bet. They're acknowledging we need to be doing some things to deal with the uncertainty out there. Like Halliburton is launching a program to accelerate clean energy layoffs. It's not just Halliburton. They don't talk about it as much as BP talked about it, but Chevron and Exxon and, and all those other companies out there are trying to put together something to be a little bit more diversified uh, in a way, hedging their bets, but also acknowledging that we need to do something as we're trying to deal with these concerns over, over climate. So let me get back to Houston, what we see going on in Houston, just kind of in general. Uh, purchasing Managers Index, also the PMI, as, as it's often referred to, a survey of purchasing managers in the region. Uh, the Institute for Supply Management, which puts this together, asks questions about production, about employment, about sales, about backlogs and orders, crunches all those numbers. And whenever it is uh, that blue line is above red line, based on all those surveys, that's a sign the economy is expanding. When it's below the red line, it's contracting. And actually, the economy can expand on the service side if it's above 45, but here it's above 50. So we are starting to see some expansion in manufacturing and services, a little bit of growth returning there. Construction starts, if, if you ignore the non-building side of construction starts, and you just look at the first two sets of bars, the commercial and the residential, they're pretty much holding their own. What we're not seeing are the big chemical projects starting up the way they were in 15, 16, and 17, uh, and, and not the big civil engineering projects. Uh, container traffic at the Port of Houston was trending down. Uh, and you can look in June and you can see it was down uh, almost, what is that, about 27,000 container units, but it's trending back up. So we are starting to see a little bit more activities at the ports, which is good to see. Uh, unfortunately, though, airport traffic is not up. This chart actually looks better than it did if I would have showed this to you in April or May. Right now, airport traffic's down by about 75%. If I showed it to you in April or May, I would have been showing you an airport that was down about 90%. And sales tax collections, they were trending down. And you once again, you can go back to April and you can see they were down almost $20 million. This is for the 12 most populous cities. 
they're picking back up again. Uh, it's still going to leave us short for the year, but it's a sign uh, that both consumers and businesses, because businesses pay sales tax, are spending. And home sales are up, setting a record. The home sales is one of the brightest spots of the economy. Part of that is because the interest rates have been so low. 30-year mortgage rates are the lowest they've been, I guess, in 30 years. And also uh, the job market is improving. And a lot of the job losses have been in kind of the lower paying jobs, the ones that tend to be renters and not home buyers. So that's one reason why home sales have stayed up so strong. So how long do we need to wait for recovery? When are we going to have a recovery in Houston? I want to talk about a little bit about history. What you're looking here is Dallas uh, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this gray bar represents a recession. And this is a recession that took place in the early 90s, associated with the first Gulf War. And the concern is you can see how this blue line is employment. And we continue to lose jobs, even though the recession was over, defined by the shaded bar. And it took us 24 months to get to the next employment for, for us to recover everything we lost and get back to where we were before. Uh, you jump over to the recession that was associated with Enron and 9-11, and that's once again this gray bar. You can see how we continue to lose jobs and flat, and it took us 39 months to get the job back, the jobs that we had lost in the downturn. And then you go to the Great Recession, and this is the real concern. You can see the pattern here taking us longer each time to come out of the downturn. And it took us 59 months, almost five years for the U.S. This is all U.S. data to get back to where it was. So the difference is, is this, those downturns are associated with what, financial events or spiking oil prices. This downturn was associated with us simply shutting down the economy to try to avoid contagion. Hopefully some of these jobs will come back a little bit faster and it's not going to take six years. But one thing I ask is that everybody, please, please, please keep your fingers crossed that this recovery looks more like the recovery that we had in the 90s and not the recovery that we had coming out of the Great Recession. Now, things are looking better. We're not out of the woods yet. There's still some challenges, especially in the oil and gas industry, but we're not as bad off as we were in April and May, and things are starting to look a bit better. So just keep your fingers crossed, guys. With that, uh, once again, Todd, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak to your members. I want to thank the members of the Texas Oil and Gas Association for taking time out to listen to me. You guys are a very important part of Houston's economy and the state's economy and the U.S. economy. And let's just make sure that the people in Washington don't forget that. So with that, thank you very much. And I'm done. And I will uh, turn it back to you, Todd. Thank you. Well, thank you, Patrick, for and the Greater Houston Partnership for that insightful presentation. Lots to think about for sure. As Patrick detailed, the road to recovery continues for every sector of the economy. And it is going to be a challenging time for our nation. But, you know, whether you're using a, a computer from home or, or in an office, whether you're preparing for a fall harvest, reopening your small business, or manufacturing a breakthrough uh, medical vaccine, the oil and natural gas industry will be a part and a significant role in powering this country's resurgence. And now for our next guest, if you know more about the importance of this industry and how it is able to take on challenging issues than the Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives, Dennis Bonin. Speaker Bonin was first elected to the legislature at the age of 24, becoming the youngest member of the House in 1997, if my memory serves me correctly. When he began his 12th term of office in January 2019, his colleagues elected him as Speaker of the House of Representatives. This last session of the legislature was focused on moving Texas forward, and many say it was one of the most successful sessions in, in recent memory. And this, is, in large part, is due to Speaker Bonin's leadership. Mr. Speaker, we're so glad you could join us today. Thank you for uh, being with us and look forward to you sharing a few thoughts with us today. Thank you, Todd. Um, you know, you're responsible for some of this having been a colleague. I think you sat in front of me when, when I was a young new House member at one point, but you were too big for the House and went to the Senate and went on to ag and I think Texoga is really lucky to have a leader who, who knows the legislature in Texas as well as you do. And so I appreciate the invitation to be with y'all. Um, we've talked a lot this year about the challenges that the oil and gas industry is going through. And, and there's been tremendous focus on COVID and people at times have forgotten that COVID is not the singular factor that is harming 
um, oil and gas industry, it's the low price of oil. And so Texas and oil and gas has had to go through the double whammy of low prices and COVID. And, but the good news is, is that, you know, the oil and gas industry, um, and I don't know if people take this in a great way, but they've been through this before. Oil and gas, y'all have lived this and you always come back, you always recover, you always make it work. And you make it work because of the innovation that oil and gas has always shown through technology um, and doing things more efficiently and things of that sort. So um, it's a tough time, but it's a, it's a time that the industry has been through before and has proven you can. And of course, it's something that's of great significance in Texas, as you know, you, you know Texas is 43% of the nation's crude production. Um, we're the third uh, large, largest nation's, uh, third of the nation's refining production, which in capacity, which I know well of in, in my district on the Gulf Coast and, and, and beyond. Um, and then our network of pipelines, and we're very proud to have, you know, the liquefied natural gas projects that are happening all over our Texas coast and Corpus and my district in Freeport and uh, Beaumont, Port Arthur area. Um, which, you know, doing something we, you know, never thought. If you look at that, there was a period years back where we, we wouldn't have imagined exporting liquefied natural gas, and now that's what we're doing. I mean, the, the project in my district began to bring it in, and then it converted and flipped and said, no, we can now send it out, which again, when it's dark, what we know in the oil and gas industry is it will be brighter tomorrow. And so, um, we've got to get through all of this. It'll be difficult. I would encourage people to remember to follow the health guidelines because what we are learning about COVID is that we can live and work around it. We can do that successfully and it's the best thing for our economy and for our friends and our neighbors to be able to do that. So um, with that, Todd, I'll, I'll be quiet and answer some questions you may have and do appreciate the opportunity. And, and, and I would just say, um, we've been through this before We've always survived, we've always been resilient, and your industry is probably the best at doing that. Um, and it's hard and it's painful, but we will come out stronger on the other side. Well, thank you for those comments. And you, you have been a consistent leader uh, in saying, be safe, follow the guidelines, and let's go about our lives. And so that's been a, a real good message for Texans and it's positioned us much better than we, we would have been otherwise. You know, as I think about your career, you, you, economic development has been a cornerstone of your public service. You, you understand what it takes to attract jobs, to, to, to attract capital. You, you mentioned a lot of the assets this industry has. You know, policies really do impact jobs. We have to get them right so they can flourish, so that citizens can have opportunities. Uh, in thinking about Texas today and the global competition that we face, as, as well as nationally in other states. Do you get the sense that we're, we're still competitive today? Or, or, and, and what do you think maybe we need to be do to stay competitive? So I do believe we're still competitive today. Uh, Texas is fortunate that we continue to be recognized um, on a national level as really the number one state in the nation for economic development, for, for a positive environment to cultivate, grow, and innovate business. And so... And, and what we really have to do is, for lack of a better way to say it, not mess it up and, and, and not to make a joke of it, um, but we almost all need to put the bumper sticker, and I'm going to say it wrong, but put the bumper sticker on that says, don't California my Texas. I mean, you know, we've got so many Californians um, coming to Texas, which we welcome them and we love to have them here, but we need to make sure they don't forget there's a reason they left California and don't bring those reasons to Texas. And so... Um, Y'all talked a touch about voting, but, you know, casting a ballot matters and who you cast it for matters because Texas has done a good job by having low regulations, low taxes and caring about those issues and knowing the ripple effect that has on job creation and the decision to bring a job um, and an investment into our state. One of the things we could improve on is the property tax. The reality of it is it's, it, it hurts our capital intensive businesses um, and it's, it's a deterrent in that regard. With that said, We've just got to make sure that we protect that. We need to be certain that we do not harm the environment that has been created in Texas. And the good news is with Governor Abbott's leadership and our Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, uh, who both be presiding next session, um, they know better than to let that change. They're leaders who have created that environment and they will fight to ensure that environment stays as it is. Well, leadership has been key and your, your leadership 
uh, starting early in your career and then chairing the House Ways and Means Committee has, has helped cultivate that environment. And certainly uh, as you serving as speaker has been, you mentioned to not met, mess this up. That's kind of, that's kind of, you know, do no harm is an important concept for government. Uh, you also mentioned California. I, you know, I think about the governor of, of California recently announcing he wants to ban fracking in his state. And I, you know, I, I just think that fracking is only a small part of the actual drilling and production process. It's, you, know, you know, it's just a small part that's used to deliver the oil and gas that we rely on. And, it, and it's actually a technique that's been advanced through technology to make the United States the global leader in oil and gas production and to provide so much for our state and our nation. The governor of California's proposal is, is really a part of the Green New Deal. And can you, you know, describe for our viewers what impact the Green New Deal would have on the state of Texas? Well, I mean, not to oversimplify it, not to be overly dramatic, it'd be devastating to the state of Texas. I mean, I would argue um, it's fascinating that the governor of California comes out with that kind of a proposal because the truth of it is um, that would not be good for California, but the Green New Deal and these type issues are truly whether anyone really wants to state it this way, and I don't think it's their entire intent, but it's a, a, in essence taking a direct shot at Texas because I think we're the number one state in the nation who would be the most negatively, and, uh, and, and we wouldn't have to, to hire researchers to point to where it's hurting us, it'd be obvious and it'd be a, a punch in the face. And then why, when we lean down, a punch in the gut and beyond, it would kill jobs, it would kill investment. Um, it would be very devastating. And in turn, it, when you kill those jobs, you kill that investment, you know, you then actually kill, you know, your infrastructure and your governments and, and, and their sources of funding and what have you. I mean, as you know, the oil and gas industry is so significant to our state um, in keeping our schools running and operating and our higher ed and everything else. And so the, the, I'm being almost sounding hysterical, but it's not hysterical. I mean, the new Green Deal would be effectually, you know, we've proudly, I think maybe it was Governor Perry would talk about, you know, having a sign, you know, uh, at, the, at the state lines that says Texas open for business. Well, hell, we, we need to flip the billboards and say, we're closed, don't come here and call your friends in Washington who did the new Green Deal. And, and, and I know it sounds dramatic, but it's the reality of what would occur um, in that situation. And, and you know, um, gentlemen from Great Eastern Partnership showed it well. Part of the Green New Deal, they want to talk to you about how, um, but we'll create these other jobs. We just saw you can't replace oil and gas jobs. You don't get to replace those dollar for dollar. You don't have the impact on that family, and and you know, and that is what matters. I mean, let's be candid. We show up and go to work um, so that we can take care of our families and our households and and, and produce. And so um, you can't replicate those with what they say will offset it. It's garbage, quite frankly. And so. It's frightening, um, and it would be the reverse of what's been happening. I'll close with this. We've gained from the bad choices made in places like California. The New Green Deal would devastate us, and then they would gain from those bad choices for, for, that would happen to Texas by federal choices. Well, and you, you've always been someone that has just told it like it is. I, I mean, what you've just described is not hyperbole. It is not oh. exaggeration by any stretch. And, and, you know, I, California, we love California. It's a great part of our union, but they have made choices. And I think recently we've seen that government mandates uh, on their electrical supply generation has resulted in electricity prices in California rising six times more than the national average from 2011 to 2019. They've been having brownouts uh, because they did it in a mandated way rather than a market-based way. Our, uh, Mr. Speaker, our industry believes in an all of the above approach on energy choices. And, and we think that's important for a consumer to have choices. Choices And thinking about that energy um, outages in California, I know you focus on that because the, your district, you understand, needs reliable power, right? I mean, you're, it, that's, isn't that a part of an economic development tool also having that reliable power? Look, you, you cannot tell a business or a major manufacturer to come into your state if they don't have the energy to run their facilities. And they have to know they can count on it. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to know it's there. And, and you know, that's one of the things we, water, electricity, all of those issues, um, whenever we're looking at these large projects on the Gulf Coast or for that matter around the state, 
they're not simply looking at what your regulatory and tax environment is. They need to know, can I count on your resources to get me through consistently? Can I count on the electricity? Can I count on the water? I mean, as, as folks with Texoga and others know, we're competing directly against Louisiana and other states. And the joke um, we're told all the time, and I know you were talking about energy, uh, electricity, but also they just got a big pipe in the Mississippi River in Louisiana. They just pull what they want. And so those resources matter and the reliability of those resources matter monumentally because that, that question, if there was one, can be the deciding factor in, in investment going elsewhere, which means the tax base goes elsewhere, the jobs go elsewhere. So those are, those are cornerstone issues to be successful in driving jobs and investment into Texas. Well, my, my team is telling me we've got a couple of minutes of your time left. So I want right. to merge an issue in this last question I have for you. I want to, you just mentioned some things that we need to be thinking about to maintain that competitiveness. So when I, when I you know, legislative sessions, as you and I know, is about, okay, what's on tap for this session? Let's take this, what's on tap for the next 20 years for Texas? Let's, let's look beyond the next session and look long-term. And, and as you do that, Mr. Speaker, Help weave in if you can. Obviously, there's a level of unrest in our country. There's a level of dissatisfaction. You've served through a number of governors, a number of lieutenant governors, a number of speakers uh, of the House, including your own. So as we think long term, what messaging do we need to do to engage this new generation of Texans who are so important to our future and to being the Texas of the future that you and I both want for our kids and our grandkids? Well, you know, I think that, you know, and your next guest is Congressman Crenshaw, and I think he's kind of a good example. I mean, if, if you paid attention to his positions and his comments, you know, he's not speaking. It's one of the things I really respect and, and like about him. He's not speaking to one simple regurgitated party line. He's, a, he's an out-of-the-box thinker who's willing to take positions um, that may not fit in the perfect box of, of this group or that group, but candidly, who he's talking to is everyone. And he's talking to young people also. And so um, we've got to be more open and more innovative. And, and candidly, we've got to be open to, to the change in the, in, in the evolution of ideas. And, and a good example would be, you know, sort of Midland, Odessa and out there in the Permian Basin. I mean, I've had some people make comments to me because last session there was a real effort to work on the infrastructure out there what do we need in the next 20 years? Infrastructure. And, and I know the Permian Basin is down because of oil prices. I know it's down because of COVID, but the reality of it is, it is not a time to pull back on the concepts and ideas and the vision that was presented last session and you know, two years ago on infrastructure for that, that market. Because the reality of it is, we're gonna need that infrastructure as we come out of this downturn to fuel them back to success. And one of the biggest mistakes that we make um, particularly in government, is that we're short-sighted in our decision-making. We need to have vision and we need to look forward because the truth of it is, I think it's one of the challenges we're seeing in California that is benefiting us. They're short-sighted in their decision-making. We need to be looking at choices we make based on, is it good for today? But almost more importantly, what is the impact of this choice in 10 and 20 years? And are we making planning decisions based on what we need to make sure we're doing for 10 and 20 years from now. And that gets into roads, that gets into water, that gets into electricity, and frankly, it gets into higher ed and public ed. You know, one of the moves made in the Permian Basin was to bring in a charter school because they were not real happy there um, with what was happening in their traditional uh, pub school. So the reality of it is we've got to look forward because what we learned in House Bill 3 in education is the decision you make today is going to take many years to see the benefit of. So you've got to make those good choices now to see the benefit down the road. And you've got to understand that these are long-term choices that you need to be preparing for the next 10 uh, to 20 years. So I'll, I'll close with that. Thank y'all, I'm so flattered for y'all to include me. And, and I want everyone to know it's tough right now. And we know that, but there is genuinely, this is not lip service. There is no more important industry in the state of Texas than oil and gas. We rely on it, we need it, and it is a great, great asset to Texas. And we appreciate everyone fighting through that industry and, and taking the lumps, but we're gonna get back to the good days and we need y'all to be with us when we get there. 
Well, thank you for spending time with us today. You give us a ton to think about, and we appreciate your leadership and what you've done for this great state. Have a great thank week. You. Good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, speaker Bonin mentioned fighting forward, and that brings me to our next speaker, from defending our country on the battlefield to defending our state in D.C. We are honored to have Congressman Dan Crenshaw as our next speaker this morning. Representing Texas's second congressional district, uh, Crenshaw is a strong advocate for this industry and the innovation of its workforce. Congressman, we're delighted to have you on with us today, and we really do appreciate you joining us and look forward to some. How y'all doing? Um, I lost your, lost your audio real quick. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we've got you. You're in good shape, and your audio and video is good. Do you Great. Great. So um, I, I guess I'll uh, start with just a few words and we're doing questions right after that. Right. Um, first yep. of all, appreciate what you guys are. Uh, appreciate y'all. Thanks for having me. Um, and uh, we're, we're, trust me, we are constantly uh, in our minds as we try to get out of this pandemic and, and get to recovery. Um, I am an oil. I've lived all over the world just because of my dad's work in the you know, oil and gas sector. Uh, he graduated from A and M as a as a petroleum engineer, and uh, I even spent a couple summers uh, uh, working on some uh, facilities of, or some Baker facilities out in Louisiana. So I uh, I know the industry to that extent, um, and uh, appreciate that everybody's taking a real hard hit. And um, you know, when I went up to Camp David, we bought a, brought a few pages of ideas. Uh, for the administration to to that they could uptake without legislation to to help the industry and for I mean these are all short term solutions but at least it would be something um, you know, we weren't as successful as we would have liked to have been um, whether it was new lending facilities for for the oil and gas sector or codifying regulatory changes or royalty relief um, and lease extensions um, or just purchasing into the uh, strategic petroleum reserve anything to help the industry. Uh, whether through this, because yeah, there's there's a lot of people out there, unfortunately, who believe that the downfall of the industry is to their benefit. Um, these people are unfortunately very ill-informed and um, do not understand the in, the environmental impact of that. It's counterintuitive, but the reality is, is it harms the environment more if you destroy the U.S. energy sector. And um, the impact to our jobs, the impact to our livelihoods, and the impact of simply turning on the lights. So uh, there's this, this is primarily an information war that we're fighting uh, alongside the pandemic and uh, we're gonna win it. Uh, so I'll stop there and, um, and uh, move on to your questions. Well, thank you. You, you, um, you have been busy. It's been a busy year. We know you've been a leader on many fronts. We appreciate that. We appreciate you spending time with us today. And you know, in thinking about the story of Texas oil and gas, it, it, it's been one of being a, a problem solver. It's been it's been a, a huge part of our economic prosperity. Mm -hmm. It's been a part of our environmental progress. It's the the ingenuity that has been demonstrated has given us a new platform for national security that I know is very important to you as well. I you know I I just think Congressman that um, a lot of people don't understand this. And then as you mentioned, there are people that want to silence the truth of the reality of the role that's played. And, and so as I think about this, I'm just wondering, what do you think the best way to overcome this misinformation, this, this climate hysteria that's being shouted very loudly so that the real story can be heard? Yeah, it, you know, there's never any silver bullet to anything, right? You gotta get the arguments right. You gotta address their concerns directly. And so, um, you know, the. The, the first assumption that has to be debunked is, is this notion that fossil fuels can never be a part of a clean energy future. Um, that's of course not true. We can always point out the, the reason that we're at about 1990 levels of carbon emissions is because of the natural gas revolution and the fracking industry. Uh, that has to just be said over and over and over again until it sinks in. Uh, these, these facts cannot be refuted. Um, and then you have to talk about, listen, if you care about global reduction in emissions, uh, not just regional reduction, because that doesn't matter, right? The only thing that matters is global reduction. 
And you have to recognize a, a few facts. Uh, one is that energy demand is going to go up, you know, 25, 30% over the next 20 years as developing countries try not to be impoverished because, and they have a right to not to be impoverished. That's the fundamental human right to try and be, have a better life uh, than you have now. And uh, you're, they're not going to get that by uh, the UN delivering solar panels to them. Uh, they're, you know, that's, that's, that's nice for some, some having some lights and a little, maybe some, uh, electric stove working for a little bit, but it, it'll never get them anywhere. They, they, they will never, they will never have what we have in America. And so that that demand is going to increase no matter what, and we have to meet it. Um, and American fuel meets it in a in a more efficient and cleaner way than Russian uh, than Russian fuel does, whether it's natural gas or oil or Saudi Arabian uh, fuel does. So that's another argument we can make. Uh, we have to, and, and then we then we point out that um, again, if you care about global emissions, and what we should be doing is exporting more of our success, the things that work, uh, exporting more natural gas, building more pipelines and export terminals, making more trade deals based on uh, natural gas exports. If that if the real goal was emissions, then that's what we would be doing. Uh, the, the, but of, but of course, the problem is is that's not their real goal. Um, it's, it's less so emissions and, and more so a, a, a really religious adherence to solar and wind. And again, you know, the fact that they don't promote nuclear either is, is a very strange phenomenon. Um, nuclear would be a far better uh, energy resource than solar and wind if they, if they cared about zero emissions. So these people are disingenuous to begin with, and it's oftentimes hard, hard to argue with people who aren't really looking for the solution. Uh, they're, they're looking for a way uh, uh, because they simply like it. And it's, it's become more religious than anything else. It's become faith-based. So it's, um, it's, it's just strange to deal with it. Uh, but yeah. those facts I laid it out are, are how we do it. Well, they are facts. I mean, that's it's not, uh, it's not subject to interpretation. I mean, you, you pointed out that if you want real environmental progress, you would be building this infrastructure and delivering this clean, reliable, affordable natural gas because... That is the reason that the world's air quality is cleaner today is because of the expanded use of natural gas. And, and you know, you understand that you, and, and you've articulated that very well. In fact, you actually have some innovative legislation that you introduced promoting research and development of carbon capture storage. I'd really love to hear about that and your thoughts surrounding it, because as I see it, Congressman, <clears throat> look, we've, we've, Americans have made a living building a better mousetrap. I mean, and a good one that so that our generation could could have it even better than our previous one. So your legislation to me addresses that theory and that concept. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, again, it's, you know, building upon what works. That, that should always be our 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 basic goal. Let's build upon what works. There's things that don't work. Um, the Green New Deal was already tried in Germany. They spent five hundred eighty billion dollars trying to transition to solar and wind. Um, didn't work. They uh, increased emissions per capita. Now have to import gas from Russia instead of our gas. Gas from Russia is 47% more emissions on a life cycle basis, according to the EPA. So these things don't work. These are silly solutions. Uh, there are no solutions at all. And so what does work? You know, well, we looked at the fact that, um, you know, in the private sector, places like uh, uh, Net Power uh, and the NRG project, had uh, been able to utilize carbon capture uh, technology in a pilot program in a rather successful way and uh, end up with zero emissions in the net, in net powers case. And so let's double down on things that are already working. Let's research how to scale that out. And so it might, my bill would be very simple. Um, it's called the Leading Act. Uh, Senator Cornyn uh, promoted it or, or sponsored it in the Senate. And um, it simply it simply repurposes grant money at the DOE uh, toward toward R and D in the uh, in the carbon capture space for natural gas. Uh, another build a new energy frontier that combines that with carbon utilization research as well. It's a commodity. You know we don't, we don't have to see this as a pollutant. Uh, you do breathe it out, by the way. So you know, but it can be used for things um, in the chemical in chemical processes, uh, cement production. Um, you know, obviously in, in, in oil uh, excavation. So there, there's lots of uses for it. You, you got to create the market, allow the market to be created and, uh, and capture it, utilize it, store it as such. 
it seems just like a much smarter option than this uh, rather silly notion of keeping it into the ground for the sake of uh, plowing down acres and acres and acres of land, doing a ton of mining for rare earth minerals to create um, the, the vast amount of solar panels needed, only just so you can have unreliable energy. Um, some of our energy problems in Texas do result from the fact that we rely so heavily on wind. We're, we've kind of touted this as something to be proud of, but I, if we're going to waste, if we're going to spend all that money on perfectly clean energy, build a nuclear power plant. You know, that, that, that's my take on it. Um, take up one acre of space and, uh, and uh, build it next to the, near the places you actually need the energy. Because when you, when you throw all these solar panels up and all these, all these wind turbines up, you got to get the energy somewhere. So you got to build additional capacity in the um, uh, transmission lines. You're losing energy that way. You can't make steel. You can't produce real thing. You can't, you can't provide energy for industry with this kind of power. There's just so many problems with it. And it just seems we've really gone the wrong direction when it comes to the clean energy conversation. And so the new energy frontier, it, 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 it's the name of this particular bill on car carbon capture, but I like the name new energy frontier to describe so much more than that. It's, an, it's a philosophy, it's a disposition, it's an approach, it's rational environmentalism. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it just means it means cleaner energy that actually works for people. And it, it means building upon the things that work. Well, you know, you're, you, what you're talking about is the energy transition. And I think that, that term gets hijacked along with others, because as you pointed out, the world's population is growing. We, we want them to have the quality of life that we have, because if they do, we're all going to get along a lot better. And uh, mm -hmm. to do that, this energy transition really means that oil and gas is gonna be a part of that. And we're gonna have a lower emission future as we continue to de develop the power that fuels this world. And um, we, you know, as I think about in our minute or two left here to just to wrap up, you, you, you have emphasized in your public service, uh, you know, protecting qualities of American greatness, our courage, our free enterprise, it's that American spirit, we appreciate that. that that's who we are as Americans. We can't lose sight of that. These are fundamental qualities that also that has driven the U.S. energy sector. And so as we think about this recent downturn, we, we, we look at the employees that are displaced. We look at the unrest that is there in our country today. You know, uh, as we think about oil and gas rebounding and our nation rebounding, uh, how can we, can, should we continue to rely on these fundamentals to get us there? Is, or is there something else that we're missing or is this where we need to really focus? Um, maybe I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I, I think I do. The, listen, we, we, we do have to focus on what works. We have to get our energy sector back up and running. Um, the, the main thing that's going to, to allow for that is uh, getting things back to normal and increase in demand. Um, now that increase is, is happening uh, uh, the, despite the wishes of every Democrat governor and mayor in the country. And, um, but, but it is happening. Uh, it needs to happen around the world, of course. You know, that, that, that's the only way that we're going to truly recover in the industry is, is to finally come to the realization that you do have to live alongside the virus and that we can live alongside the virus safely. Uh, we always had to, and that you can't add more costs on top of that um, to livelihoods, uh, to our jobs, to everything, um, only, only to receive no benefit from it, which is really what we've seen from the sort of, kind of massive lockdowns that we've had. So uh, getting people back to normal is, is, there's a variety of ways to do that. One of, one of which is, is simply stop the fear mongering and give people the facts on, on what the risks are and how to deal with it. You, you hit the nail on the head, and that was my purpose in the question. I mean, it's that entrepreneurial spirit that has built this country. It's the ability to um, take risk and reward. It's the ability to uh, develop and through research and innovation, new technologies that have been game changers. And I think that's what your legislation is, is promoting is that same spirit that I think uh, this this generation doesn't need to forget. This is what built this country, and this is, these are the same types of things that will enable us to move beyond where we are today. So, uh, thank you for joining us, Congressman. We appreciate it. I hope to have you 
in person here before too long. Uh, any closing thoughts as we wrap up today? Uh, uh, no, no, stay strong. Thanks for having me. Uh, we, we've got your back, of course, and uh, get out and vote. <laughs> yeah, good, good message. We appreciate that. Be safe. Have a good rest of the week. All right, have a good one. Bye. Thank you. You know, we're proud of the fact that Texans, uh, uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents, libertarians, whatever label you go by, we're all Texans and we all want to move forward. And, and that's the real message as we look at our energy summits and powering forward. We want to power forward together. And we're excited that we've been able to bring this series to you. This just about concludes today's program. And we certainly appreciate Patrick Jankowski with the Greater Houston Partnership. We appreciate Texas House Speaker Dennis Bonin and certainly who you just heard from, Congressman Dan Crenshaw. All important and thoughtful comments that we heard today. And the, and the message is, is that we know that there are challenges ahead. We know that at the state level, the national level, at the local level, communities in Houston and Southeast Texas and across our state have to address budget issues as well as a host of other challenges. We want you to know the oil and natural gas industry looks forward to bouncing back. We look forward to being a part of the mix of a strong Texas as we get this pandemic under control and that we continue to create opportunities for this next generation. And there are different ideas on how to do that. We want you to know that the facts confirm that Texas oil and natural gas is making our nation and our state cleaner, stronger, better. We are proud to partner with the businesses and the families in Houston and Southeast Texas who want a bright future for you and for your families. Most of all, we are so thankful to each of you who have joined us today. Some of you have joined us over the last few weeks for our virtual energy summit series. Getting the right information out is what is needed for sound energy policy. And that's why we ask you to do two things. One, don't forget to register to vote before Monday. That's the deadline to register to vote in this upcoming election cycle. It's just uh, four more days of being able to do that. So make sure you're registered. Uh, it ends on Monday, October the 5th. And the second thing that we'd like to ask you to do is just take your, your phone right now and text the word Texoga to this number that's on your screen, 52886. 52886, it's on your screen. And this will allow you the option to subscribe to email updates, providing the latest information about oil and natural gas. We promise we won't spam you, but here's the theme we've heard from all of our speakers. You have to get the science-based factual information out. And if you don't like what you're getting, you can unsubscribe at any time. To close today and to close our series, we have a short video about the very key to success in the energy world, and that is the men and women who make up this great industry. This concludes today's program and our Virtual Energy Summit series. We are so thankful to you for tuning in. We hope you have a great week. And remember, be registered to vote and then you need to engage. Have a great week. What does it mean to be an employee of the energy industry? It means hard work, dedication, and ingenuity. It means utilizing the latest innovative technologies. It means proudly serving the industry that's defined Texas over the last 100 years. Our industry has fueled our past, and Texans can count on us to fuel our next 100 years. We work because we care about Texas, our nation, and our world. And we are committed to building a better future. Excellence is our standard. Safety, security, and science are at our core. Over 100 years of excellence, ingenuity, and innovation. And we are always looking for ways to improve. Because this is our economy, our environment, and our future too.